Well, next is Anna Heringer. Many of you will be familiar with her work. She's doing extraordinary work in the rehabilitation, reconstruction of uh, rammed earth uh, structures. We met in Brussels because Terracidia and uh, Anna, uh, uh, Anna received the Rotier Prize. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and I really enjoyed the first presentation a lot. Oh, I have to stand here. So architecture to me is a tool to improve lives. Unfortunately, also the opposite is true. Architecture can destroy. But I firmly believe we, as architects, we can do better than now. We can, we deal with a lot of resources, with a lot of money also, that gives us a lot of responsibility, but also power for change. And architecture is really a powerful tool for change. And I believe we can build not just structures, but we also can build up good communities. And I think that's a wonderful thing that we can do with architecture. So is there somewhere, how do I... Ah. So this picture shows a study trip I did with my students from ETH Zurich a couple of years ago. It was the end of October. It was super cold. It was still frost on the ground at three o'clock in the afternoon. And I surprised the group with the fact that I had not booked any hut or accommodation for the night and that it was a challenge to build your own shelter with whatever you could find. And the results were not really luxurious, <laughs> but it was a great learning experience that there are a lot of resources given by nature for free. And all we need is the creativity or the the sensitivity to see those resources and then the creativity to use them. And I was a bit in a similar situation. I went with 19 years old, I went to a remote Bangladeshi village called Rudapur with the aim to learn or to see life from a different perspective. And what I learned from the NGO what is, what was exactly the same. You know, you have to look at the resources you have at your hands and try to make the best out of it and not trying to depend on external factors, you know, and that's the most resilient or the most effective strategy for resilience and sustainable development. And this is what I trust, tried to transfer into architecture a couple of years later. In terms of materials, I, I designed a school and in terms of materials, I didn't have to look far, they were right under my feet, earth and the bamboo that was growing all around. And in terms of local energy sources, it was people. I mean, when we think of energy sources, we think of sun, we think of wind, we think of oil, but we as human beings, we are also sources of energy and we are a growing source more than, you know, we are almost eight billion people. So we need to use this source as well. Otherwise we create a social problem. We need to create work through architecture. So it was really basic. We rotated or mixed with, with water buffaloes and cows, the mud, and the, we had no electricity, so very similar to the situation that you probably had in Morocco. And after six months of construction, the school looked like this, really load-bearing earth wall, no cement in the walls, only in the foundation, and then the bamboo uh, roof, the uh, second floor or first floor. We kept the tradition to sit on the ground, and through these bolt holes, you come into the cave areas. The briefing of the client was to build a school where children actually love to go inside and feel well and open up their senses. And I tried to remember the spaces that I loved when I, loved that when I was a kid. And I think that's a very archaic pattern, you know, the caves, the protection, the warmth like feeling, but still always having the connection to the classroom and to the crowd and, and the people so that you're not kind of excluded. So you still have always the connection, which I think, you know, you, you're kind of hidden away, but you have the overview of what's going on. And the opposite feeling, the kind of the tree house atmosphere in the, in the top floor. The children all signed with the names on the doors and they rightfully did so because they also helped building the school. And you cannot do this with every 
building material. But with earth, it's a wonderful inclusive material. It's not harmful. You don't need sophisticated tools. You can use only your hands and it's wonderful to touch. It's non-toxic. So it's really for me one of the beautiful assets of earth that it is so inclusive. We also had people with disabilities working on the site, of course, men and women and also elderly people. So it was really a fantastic diversity in the team. And I guess you can all imagine how it feels when you're a small boy or a girl standing after six months in front of your school and you know you built this thing with using only your hands, your own muscles and the dirt beneath your feet that just gives an enormous boost in confidence in your own talents and your own skills in the team and of course in the local materials that have a very bad image there. Like especially the mud, I think that's a, c a problem all over the world that it is seen as a material of the poor, although it is such a beautiful and wonderful material. So you can build it in a very durable way. I mean, there are lots of hundreds of year old earthen houses all around the globe. Show me a house built out of Portland cement that is 500 years old. It's not existing. <laughs> I mean, you have the Port Solano, but not the, the, the current cement that is not that old. So, um, well, so these walls are hit by horizontal monsoon rains since 2005 and the walls are standing strong. We didn't have to repair the walls. The bamboo, yes, we did some mistakes with the bamboo, but the walls are really, the earth walls are standing strong. You have to have to, to do some, apply some certain rules, good boots, meaning a good foundation, a good hut, a good roof, and then the walls are really standing strong. In terms of economic sustainability, it was for me really wonderful to see that, you know, the, the, I mean, the workers got paid on a daily basis. Every evening they would get the money and then together we would go um, to the local market. And I could see how the workers spent the money, their share of building budget. And it was invested in the, buying vegetables from the neighbor or the local farmers, getting a new sourplus from the local tailor, getting the bicycle repaired. So the building budget was really reinvested in the community. And the effect of the building budget was not just a building, was not just a school, but it was also a catalyst for local development. And if I had built that school in concrete and steel, this money would have been lost for the community. And for me, when it comes to economic sustainability, it's never the question just low cost, low cost, which is the usual case. But for me, the question is who gets the profit and who gets the benefit. And I think that's much more important anywhere in the world. <laughs> so this is the question. And I'm asking this the same, you know, when I'm, I'm working in Germany or when I'm working in, in in Austria, it's always the same question, you know, I want to be able in the end, you know, when I'm adding, summing up all my building budgets in the end of my life, I want to be able to tell myself that it ended up with those who really needed it and not just making the rich industries even more rich. The last building I did in the same village in Rutupur in the northern part of Bangladesh is a, is a center for people with disabilities and a, a workshop for um, fair clothes production. I'm wearing one of those. So um, unlike the first building that is very much box-like and precise and about some other buildings there that are also the same way, very kind of boxes and, and precise, which was, I think, important in the beginning to show you can do precise architecture with those traditional materials. You can go really also in, in refined edges and everything. But with this one, you know, I wanted to show it's good that we have a diversity, that, that we human beings not just follow all the same kind of pattern, the same norm, but we have people that break out of the mold. And that is something beautiful and that is something to celebrate. So this building is actually celebrating this diversity and is breaking out of the mold, literally. So when you approach the building, the first thing you see is this, is this ramp that winds up all around the building. And already during the construction site, you know, people came and said, you know, why do you need a ramp? Because it's the only ramp in that area, the only ramp they have ever seen. So it makes it clear, you know, you're immediately at the topic of inclusiveness. And that's also a powerful thing on architecture, that you can make things very much or very clearly visible and, and ideas and concepts. These are the therapy rooms on the ground floor. 
And underneath the ramp, we have caves that are different than the ones in Metis, so you can really crawl in from the ground and you can crawl much longer and it's a bit more difficult. And it's also part of the therapy, you know, that the children have to move their bodies in a different way than they usually do. So they train their muscles, they train their coordination skills. So it's a very, and of course, it's a, it's a rewarding thing. You know, it's not just, you know, you have to practice on a kind of instrument, but it's kind of a nice area. And besides that, it's also, you know, that the children from the village, the, the ones that are having no disabilities, they also try to sneak in because they love that space, but they know they are kind of the guests of the children with disabilities. So it's a kind of small little universe where different rules apply and it's kind of a different zone also for connecting with each other. So these are, is the, the, the ramp built of, out of bamboo and earth and also the terraces. And this is the workspace of Dipti Textiles, where I'm, yeah, we're just preparing actually also a show in the Eco Museum in Madrid. So if you are here in February, you're most welcome to see the results of the, the work of the women there. It was one of the blankets. And for me, that is also part of, of, you know, architecture. I'm not a fashion designer. I'm not a textile designer. I'm doing this as an architect because I saw, you know, that the settlement pattern in Bangladesh is the most dominating factor the who actually, uh, uh, sorry, the garment sector is, the, is that um, element who influences the settlement patterns most dominantly in Bangladesh because, you know, the, it drags all the labor force from the villages into some of the, of the hubs, of the fabrication hubs, and that really um, has a, a huge impact on the villages because you know, the women or have to leave their families, they have to go and live in this kind of textile hubs where their life is very much depending on external factors, where they lose a lot of independence and a lot of, a lot of life quality. So I wanted to bring in some work uh, opportunities for the women to be able to stay with their families and you know, also to keep the village alive. This is a documentation of the village. We were working at that, for example, is the Metis School, and that is the building I just showed you. And these kind of blue dots here, these are all the excavation sources for the mud houses. And the dark green dots are all, I think I have it here more <laughs> bigger, the dark green ones is all the bamboo that is growing around. And then, of course, you have the, the paddy fields that provide the straw for the roofs and, of course, also the food. And then you have little house gardens and so on. So the circularity of materials, for construction, but also for daily life is, is really very close and that makes it so sustainable. I have been there just two weeks back and unfortunately the village has dramatically changed within these two years that I wasn't there because of the pandemic, I couldn't travel. And now the government is handing out tin houses for free and they're tearing down all the mud houses and replacing them with these tin um, shelters and I asked him yeah, how, how they feel in winter, how they feel in summer. And I said, well, of course, <laughs> it's not as comfortable. But, you know, if you get something for free and it's shiny, <laughs> yeah, that was a painful process or <laughs> a moment to, to experience that these are changing. And then, of course, you see also a lot of brick houses. And then when you, when you pass by these brick fields, you see the piles of coal lying around and then Suddenly, also a lot of electricity is there before it was um, not so much in, in that quantity, but people had solar energy. Now they have electricity also powered by coal. They close the windows during the daytime and have the lights on. So there's a lot of changes happening that is making clear that we still have a lot of work in front of us, <laughs> but we're not giving up. <laughs> so, yeah. No matter if I'm working with, with architecture or textiles, the underlying approach is always local materials plus local energy, especially people, labor, human craftsmanship, plus global knowledge. I think that knowledge should not be, lo um, not be limited to a, to a specific place. I think it should be accessible anytime, everywhere. But it's always important to apply this global knowledge and know-how to the, to the existing resources. And I think that triggers also the creativity. So I'm doing this in when I'm working in, in Europe. That was the first commission that I had that was 
um, the headquarter of El Omicron Electronics that had sponsored some of the projects that I did and they wanted to have some of that atmosphere in the headquarter in Austria. I did it together with Martin Rauch. And we wanted to test the most basic um, building method, taking the wet soil, the local wet soil, and just shaping it by hand without any formwork and so on. But we wanted to do it in a two-story way. So this was the design that we did and the way we built, super low tech. But inside you see the cables, you have all the electricity, you also have the heating, you have cooling and so on. And of course also the air flows and sound system <laughs> included, but still the building technique is absolutely low tech. And this is the space underneath. And kind of the niches for the power naps. And this is another structure we did. It's a wooden structure that is hanging from the ceiling that is covered with um, fair trade silk. And you also see the shiny surface that was also done similar like the Tadelakt in Morocco just by, by polishing the mud with semi-precious stones. And that's the other structure, the Zeppelin. I'm also working a lot with bamboo and I was invite, invited in China for a bamboo biennale along with other architects like Ken Kukuma, for example, and Simon Welles. So um, the idea was to show and to prove that you can build with old materials, but it doesn't mean that you have to use always old architectural language, but you can also do it in a modern way. And I think it's very important. I'm often asked, do you want to send people back to Stone Age? Of course not, but it's not a matter how old a material is. It's a matter of our creative ability to use it today. So this was kind of, um, these were youth hostels, three, three hostels that we built and with really an intensive um, bamboo weaving structure. The idea was to have a, a core that hosts all the facilities and attached to this core and staircase, there are like these concons, like tents or Chinese lampshades where then the boys and girls could go to for sleeping. Oh, this should be a video, but I think it's, is it working? Yeah, it's working. So. <laughs> So they really did a fantastic job in the in the bamboo weaving. And here you see the interior structure. And of course, this is the reality all around. <laughs> Between 2011 and 2013, China has consumed more cement than the United States in the past century. And it's not just China, this is happening in India and I mean so many countries around, around the world and we clearly cannot continue like this. We have to look for alternatives such as, as, as timber, such as earth and so on. And of course you need to find also different tools. You can work in high tech, you can work in low tech. The quality is always the same. As I said, this is a, a kind of factory, earth factory in Austria that transfers the local excavation material into building blocks. You see the machine here, it's ramming the whole wall. It's cut into pieces and then applied on the site and joined again with mud and water. So this is a structure that I built again with Martin Rauch, it's a health. Um, facility in, in Germany, where we also aim to ha reach a happy frugality, you know, less space, less square meters, but high quality and healthy materials, high quality of craftsmanship. It's a timber load bearing timber structure with a willow facade, willow weaving facade, and inside we have all this earth. The last project I want to show is also in Germany. It was a competition for building um, a new altar, which was really delicate because it, first it was the 1000 year old birthday of the cathedral and the interior is made by Balthasar Neumann. So it was very difficult to put something in front of it. And you know that one priest delegated the task to the next uh, generation priest because everyone was afraid to do the wrong action, you know, in front of, what do you put in front of Balthasar Neumann? So really difficult. But we decided, you know, not to bring the ready-made object, but to bring the tools, the materials, and that the community gets together to build up this altar, you know, to celebrate the community. And that was a wonderful um, experience. We also, you know, initially the concept was to bring in historic elements from the Roman times and so on, from the rich historic times of, of Worms, of the city of Worms. But 
day after day, you know, people started to bring also their personal items, you know. Amulets went in, the best wine, the honey of the region, newspaper articles, letters, postcards. So a lot of personal items went in and it became more and more really an object of the community or, or kind of a reflection of the community. The children all came. They put in some pink glitter that you will see now in a second, which didn't, you know, much to the dismay of the of the priest, he was in panic that the altar would glitter in pink in the end, which was not the case. <laughs> and you know, we had everyone from the from the choir, from the council, from the altar boys and girls, and that was, you know, the moment, you know, where we were standing in front of the finished object and we just want you know we couldn't let go we constantly wanted to touch it and what you see here on the on on this picture so much on the faces of the people you know you're not just building a building you also build up a community and that's the wonderful thing in the past we came together as society built a city hall built a church built a mosque whatever and this kind of pulling on one direction to, to reach one common aim, I think that is something that really fostered our community. And now we delegated the act of building always to experts. And we don't have this community building processes anymore. But I think that's a huge loss. And we have to enable participation again. And this picture is for me very symbolic for our society, you know, with all the gold in the background. We are not lacking of materiality. We are lacking, lacking of good relationships. But this is something the process of construction and architecture can also provide. Question is form follows what? Form follows function, I think, is outdated. I mean, it's, architecture is much more complex and society is much more complex and we have to react to this. So to me, you know, we have a lot of functional buildings. We have a lot of good looking buildings, but we need meaningful buildings and really beautiful buildings. And the question is, what is real beauty? And to me, it's a formal expression of love. So to me, if it would be form follows love. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna.